think we're going to soon start. I don't know if I can get the slides, the orange slide back on the screen. Yep, great. So I'd like to welcome you in this uh, room. Uh, I was a little bit surprised that there were so many people actually interested in the telco view around OpenStack, uh, knowing that it came from uh, many, many OTT companies, small startups, plus the usual uh, suspects in the valley around open source, but certainly not at the beginning from uh, telcos. There was a rally of many, many uh, key players in the telco world in the last two years. Uh, and it, it brought us to really re-envisage the way a telecommunication service provider would operate in the future. Uh, what I will share with you today is not so much about the technicalities, and uh, by the way, there were uh, several, several uh, shows open with fantastic contributors to the OpenStack code, so <laughs> I wouldn't want to compete with these guys. It's more about the transformation that we do go through as a telecommunication service provider uh, when we envisage going to the cloud. You know, we have uh, 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 our CEO who claims that Orange is a leading operator in the internet era. Uh, many of us uh, will probably wonder what that means. Well, probably moving to the cloud is one of the most concrete, tangible thing that we can uh, use to exemplify the change. Going to cover five items. Uh, at any moment, please feel free uh, asking questions. Uh, the only value of this is being an exchange. Uh, start with a little bit of uh, what we call the cloud manifesto. Pretty interesting change of mindset within a telco. The opportunity for us to change the way of working as we go to the cloud. Um, why do we believe that we do? We need to do some things specific to a telco operator on the grid. What could a target urbanism look like when you look at the telco inside? And uh, more, more generally, how do we uh, position Orange versus many open source projects and communities? Um, the first thing is, when moving to the, to the Cloud Manifesto, I actually would like to, to thank the guys who years and years and years ago, on the research side, worked out I would say, against all established opinions, that there would be a massive disruption in the market thanks to open source solutions like OpenStack. And if you remember at that time, VMware was the king of the world with regard to virtualization, uh, getting gradually into the cloud. And OpenStack was still at that time a small potential alternative. But the guys detected that there was a great potential. And they helped us shaping our policy towards the cloud. They helped us also identifying the key options that we would need to take in order to be successful when transforming the business to the cloud. And I insist on transforming the business to the cloud and not transforming a technical stack because most of what I'm going to be discussing today is more about the transformation of the company than a pure adoption of a technical solution. Look like... Uh, we, let's say a bunch of five uh, key decision makers on the technical side in Orange, uh, finally agreed to consider and to state that we were something like 10 to 15 years late regard to OTTs, and that it was more than time that we should catch back. One of the key things with OTTs is that these guys are different, have a different way to manage technologies, have a different way to manage the business. So we are trying to find out what these guys were doing, which we could take. Well, actually, we were lucky enough that they helped open sourced many of their technologies. So one of the key things is we could take over a lot of their, of their technologies. The other thing is we also try and take the way they do business. Now, agility is typically what is made uh, the, the, the mark of their DNA and most of our customers don't tell us that we are agile. Don't know why. Uh, they also uh, try and make this agility in the time to market the main feature of the whole organization A to Z. 
which means a global and deep transformation for a company like Orange, which was established on a very classical pattern. A classical pattern means that somebody in the marketing will think of the next uh, service, uh, will uh, cr write a thick document specifying what they would like, hand over to the guys in engineering who will try and decipher that and put that into technical words, would get somebody outside of the company developing it or would source a solution which would be close enough for the requirements, then would hand over that workload to the operations, would struggle to get something operated, etc., etc., etc. And in the end, the guy who made the, the uh, expression, the, the, the requirements, will actually discover that what he got is completely different from what he actually uh, dreamt of. And it's really something which was repeatedly, repeatedly, day in, day out, happening in a, in a company like Orange. One of the key things here is to say, OK, we want to change the paradigm. And again, it's not a question of technology. It's a question of cultural shift. Get the customer inside the room. OK, fine. Everybody says that since 20 years. But how, how do you actually do it? Uh, get the marketing to work uh, day to day with the technical guys who are developing the solutions. So adopt different posture, different mindset. Make sure that the guys get into a product owner mode, according to whatever agile method you can think of. Uh, and make sure that the whole set infrastructure, amongst others, will be compatible with that. Today, an engineer who would want to provision a platform in Orange would take weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. That's the reality today. He will have to struggle ag across many heterogeneous technologies. He will have to get flows open from one island to the other in the data center, sometimes from one data center to the other, which is even more complex because you will get across multiple teams. Well, how does he get? the benefit of what is the day-to-day -day life of an OTT player, which is how do you provision more or less freely the same platform in minutes and spend your time focusing on the service itself, on the definition of the application, and not on managing the bits and bolts of the infrastructure. Also, how do you enable the, the uh, new service that will want to get released on the market to freely consume capabilities, resources, exposed by the rest of the legacy stack. Which means, how do you open APIs? How do you loosely decouple modules of services, enablers, etc., within the setup? All of that is bread and butter for any company on the West Coast. And it's certainly not the way most telcos operate today. So there is just a deep shift with regard to how the company from A to Z will uh, operate. There is also another, another big risk, is that we would confuse the cloud and the virtualization. Virtualization is things which we are doing over the last five to eight years, depending on countries. And we do have most of our workloads running on virtualized infrastructure. But that brings no change. What I mean there is that, it doesn't help you get a service promoted to the business, to the market, in minutes. You're still struggling with the same urbanism. You're still struggling with the same question of having multiple teams cooperating together to get a platform provisioned. Now, when you would want to put a code from a legacy world onto a virtualized infrastructure, you do struggle, but most of the time you will succeed. What does it bring you? If you face reality, in most cases, a legacy code will best run on a good, bare, metal stuff. And if you put it on a virtualized infrastructure, best case, it will get a little bit less robust, a little, best, a little bit less performant. But you may still may make it work. And then you move it to the cloud, what do you get? Pretty nothing, no advantage. On the contrary, if you do embrace deeply what the cloud means in terms of Leveraging on the infrastructure very differently. Leveraging on the elasticity, the resilience that you will get, not from the infrastructure, but from the code. 
massively spanning multiple instances of your applications across multiple data centers to reach the level of, res of resilience that you need, then you will get a very different world. But what does that mean? Your coders need to code differently. Your operators need to operate differently. You need to be able to monitor that. Well, most of telcos do not have the tools to monitor that today, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So again, when you look at the way you would redesign your application, it is a challenge because the simple uh, level of readiness of the infrastructure and the process is not there in most telcos. And then, again, you need to adopt what makes uh, OTTs much more agile and efficient, which is where it makes sense, and I insist on the where it makes sense, go DevOps the whole way, meaning get the marketing, the, the engineering team, the operations team in the same room working together as a project team, which again goes against culture, goes against the usual way to do business. So it is a deep transformation. Having said that most key uh, technical decision makers in Orange acknowledge the fact, we also set the ambition, which is that's nevertheless where we want to go. And we're going to unify the various efforts across the Orange footprint to really make it happen in a reasonably short time frame, reasonably short time frame compared to the history of a, a company like Orange, not the history of a startup. So we do not have a view that a company like Orange can transform in one year. It will not happen. But we have a view that by 2020, we can have our eligible applications really cloudified, operated in a different way, moved onto different infrastructures. Eligible applications, what does it mean? Well, most probably you do not want and you have no return on investment to cloudify a very stable backend which runs on its legacy infrastructure. Don't touch it. Just put APIs on top. But wherever you interact with a customer, wherever you have a front end, systematically cloudify it. Benefit from elasticity. Allow the customer to really drive the way he will consume the service. So reverse the relationship between the application and the customer, the application and the resources he will actually use. Make sure that you digitalize completely the relationship with the customer and that the customer will benefit from the cloud in its turn, not only you. Networks are going through a massive transformation right now. All vendors are trying to get their appliances transformed into a piece of software that's going to run on OpenStack. Fine. By 2020, will the whole network be transformed? Maybe not. But at least all the core network will be. All the VAS will be. Everything that is really non-adherent to the copper or fiber cable, everything which is non-adherent to the antennas on top of the roof, all of that could be massively, massively transformed. And then what we call services is all the rest, service platforms. All of that will be cloudified because it's the only way for us to still be alive in 2020 facing OTTs which go faster and again who are 10 years ahead of us with regard to the technology. So we made that public inside the group. Any partner who is interested can, can get the cloud manifesto. In itself, for decision makers within Orange to publish inside the company a manifesto was already a shift of culture, right? Try and put your guts on the table and commit that you're going to transform the company by 2020 is something that is not so usual within Orange. So just wanted to highlight with that slide that the cloud thing is not and will not be a technology challenge. It is a deep, deep, cultural transformation of the whole business. There is no team in Orange which, which can say that the cloud is something for the others. We are all involved. Usually when you take a, an operator today, and, and some operators claim they have advanced and changed, but what I see with my peers when I discuss with them is pretty much looking like that. You have a marketing BU and you have uh, marketing people who are dreaming of a service. They run on their own. 
then you have design teams or development teams which will try and do something out of it. Mostly with components because usually we do consider large scale services which have a strong functional uh, complexity and they will dump the code over the fence to people who will go try and get it integrated with the whole rest of the setup and here when we say integrated it's with plenty of technologies that you guys never heard of because maybe you're too young sometimes to, to even have heard of it right this is not by far an all IP world we do face the difficulty to integrate with what we have which is a pile of very diverse and very legacy technologies and get the quality under control which is not always so easy and then hopefully you will pass some some steps of quality and you will hand it over to operation who soon will discover what this service means because beforehand they had no real touch with the service so the moment you hand over is sometimes the first time they ever hear about the service and they get the shit posted over the fence. Now, most of the enablers we have are running on legacy infrastructure. When I say most, it's probably 99.5% of our enablers which are running on legacy infrastructure to date. It's moving, and when you could look at the number of workloads moving on the, on the cloud, it's growing fast, but still compared to the stock, it's a teeny bit. One of the legacy, one of the challenges is really to get proper APIs on those legacy enablers so that they would behave as if they were cloudified towards cloudified uh, uh, workloads. And then you have a nice computing grid, plenty of, of tools around, pretty much empty to date with a very strong ability to expose APIs. But again, so far, few tools, services, people are using those APIs. It's getting, it's really changing fast, it's growing fast, but still compared to the stock, it's a teeny bit. When we say Cloudify, we start very often, because we are rational people, talking about the green bit. How should we evolve the processes? How should we get the guys to work together as one team and not as four different silos running in sequence? And very often you stop there and then you fail. Because simply the problem is not the process. The problem is culture and skills. Culture. Getting the guys who is in marketing to consider that he should actually talk to, work with, the engineers. Getting the engineers to consider that the guy who is bringing him marketing details is not, is not simply talking bullshit, right? Because the guy doesn't know how to code. Thing like that. So we need to get a cultural shift by having people dreaming of collaborating within a end-to-end -end project instead of considering that they are the expert in their domain and that they should be consulted. Moving from consultation to contribution is a first step. Then getting a level of trust across the organization that a project team could actually make the right choices. That they shouldn't go through committees, validations, senior management kind of approval, but that if we gather the right people in a project team with the right skill set, then we should trust them that they will do the right choices. Ooh, that's a tough one. And that's 100% against the traditional telco culture. Sharing. Just one, one kind of sharing which is antagonistic to our culture. Today, service A will consume a capacity exposed by service B in a nice SOA mode. Well, the first thing the team in service A should do is talk with service B. Because you never know. And by the way, because the service B will demand that they are consulted before the service is consumed by anybody else. In the, in the, in the cloud world, it is a nonsense, right? You expose an API and 
happens what will happen. And if somebody will use it, it's a great thing, because that means your stuff is useful. And if nobody is using it, then Darwin will kick in. And soon your stuff is going to be decommissioned. It's a completely different mindset. When you will go there, you will also consider that simplicity is driving the show. If you take a classical provisioning, fixed provisioning mediation in a telco operator, this fixed provisioning will probably manage 100 plus use cases. Because each and every possible service which came on top wanted their own stuff implemented in a mediation, right? That's a weakness of being able to doing it. The technical guys were saying, yes, we can do it. So they did it. Now, in the new world, you would probably say, let's expose three or four of these use cases through an API and leave the choice to the project. Either they can cope with one of these use cases, or they're going to have to go through a end-to-end -end integration process. And then, believe me, they will find a way to cope with what is exposed. Because if you take five minutes to consume what is exposed versus six months to get the end-to-end -end integration done, it's a life and death sentence on a service. Skills. If you take, for instance, the, the marketing boy, today has a conviction. He visualizes, he has a mental map of what he wants as a service. This mental map is actually extremely difficult to share. So he tries and describes it, hands it over to the engineering. Engineering will understand it with their own ADM, and they will probably understand it differently. What we tell them is, don't have any conviction. Maybe start with something small, and then put it at the test of the customer and listen what the customer will say. And if the customer loves it, great. If the customer doesn't, stop it. And if the customer loves it, listen to what they want more. And then your whole roadmap is driven by the customer. But that means the design people will have designed the service in a way that you can collect usage data. The operational people will then have an, an ability to collect the data and to expose it back to the business, thing like that. Well, marketing will evolve. What about the technical guys? The risk we face is that we have, for instance, software developers who believe that they can code. And by the way, they can code. But maybe they can code in a legacy way. And we tell them to move to the cloud, we tell them, OK, forget about all those nice licensed database engines with a brand name starting with O. Go for open source stuff, no SQL. Make sure that your service will actually consume very small VMs, but you will actually span them elastically by numbers. Make sure that whatever you do is stateless, that it can crash. And by the way, I'm going to crash some of them voluntarily. I will send chaos monkeys on it. Seeing like that is a completely different world. So we are reskilling our developers. Technical architect, very interesting when you go into the integration. Today, the guy receives a document showing what the service should look like. He understands the software which is going to run, all the softwares and piece of software which is going to be run. He will start writing a Word document. With this Word document describing the hardware, the software, the network configuration, all the flows to be open, blah, 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 he will give it to maybe a subcontractor who will actually implement that or who will provision it on the, on the virtualized infrastructure, etc., etc., etc. Six months. Tomorrow, the same guy should just script an XML page and push it to production. Not exactly the same skills. Not exactly the same relationship to the project. Not exactly the same way to collaborate and having iterative definition of the infrastructure as the project will develop. And if you know that the next release is tomorrow and not in six months, at each and every of these steps, you will allow for much more trial and error. Because you know it can be corrected the, 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 the day after. 
while if you know it's going to take six months, you bloody sure want you bloody want to make sure that it's going to be perfect. And perfection doesn't exist, so you just delay everything. It's a very, very, very strong shift of mindset and ways of working. The key word behind that, allowing for all of that to happen, is two things. You need the security to be preserved. So the first things we did before dreaming of whatever automation tool, infrastructure whatsoever was, how do you completely revamp the security urbanism when you move to the cloud? What does that mean, moving to the cloud from a security perspective as a telco? Because, believe it or not, we, we believe, we think, we, we know roughly how we should manage security here, but uh, it's not so clear when you go to the cloud. Well, most of that is perimetric security. Perimetric security in the cloud has no meaning. So how do you take share, make sure that you empower a project with all the right tools and capabilities to secure their own app. Shift. The other is automation. If anything is manual, it's dead. It's dead because you will continue doing the same mistakes, so there will be faults as you will move software to production, but also it's dead because we are competing in a world which now counts minutes as we were counting years, 10 years ago. And we simply cannot afford any manual stuff. What is so specific with telcos that we should have our own flavor on a, of an open stack? Well, the first thing is we would like not to have. And ultimately, I think every bloody business will need the same level of resilience, reliability, and the same open stack in the end will, will meet everybody's needs. But to date, we saw and we spotted several problems which made OpenStack, as it stands today, not really compliant with our needs. It doesn't mean that it is a fatality. For instance, you are a startup, you put a workload on the Amazon cloud, you don't care. You don't need intranets, you don't need secure networks, blah, blah, blah. You expose everything to the internet. And if needed, you will do some VPNs between one workload or the other, and it will work, right? However, that may not be scalable. That may not be scalable, that's a one problem. The other problem is, it is so contradictory with the previous way of operating that you may not see a way to get it interoperating between the new world and the legacy world. So you need to find a trade-off. So for instance, we need to be able to manage internal networks as well as internet connectivity to the workloads. So we defined urbanisms which we can deploy automatically on each and every network, on each and every project, that could allow us for managing various protocols and the interconnection with the legacy world. Also, we need to be able to interconnect with legacy software and sometimes to just bring as legacy software on it. Well, bringing legacy software on it is a nightmare. We try and not do it. The, the best learning is don't do it. If you can avoid, don't do it. Just take new software, cloud ready, put it on it. Legacy software, don't do it. There are other things like VMware which we'll cover. We need really to have a standard way of working on the grid. What I mean here is that we do offer cloud services to our customers. These customers are mainly large B2B companies, right? So the CIOs which we meet actually face exactly the same challenges as the ones we do face within Orange. Somehow I'm a, I'm a CIO of a large company because I'm managing plenty of workloads running on plenty of different legacy stuff and are trying to, to, to translate to the cloud. They do exactly face the same challenge. So we ended up with the conclusion that once we will have our setup ready, it is actually completely adapted to large accounts needs. So we're going to use it exactly the same stack, the same product, the same setup for private instances running Orange networks and services, for 
private instances that we do deploy for our customers or for public instances that we use to offer to SMEs or large accounts. Why? Because getting to that point secures that we will make no trade-off on the security, on the scalability, on the, on the urbanisms and the design. And then there is a, 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 a deep conviction around the code. We do believe that there is a need to control the code. Hence, an open source solution is ideal. Two reasons for that. First, we need to know on what we put our customers' data. Because we have an accountability towards our customers that we will be able to manage the privacy and the security. If you go on a black box, you just do hope that the guy who delivers to you the black box does his job well. If you have access to the code, you can audit whatever you want, and you may help securing the, the solution, which, by the way, we do. So we contribute back to the community plenty of things which we uh, see. The second is, this OpenStack stuff is not a question for data centers. Most companies will envisage OpenStack for the data centers only because that's where they operate. But we do operate outside of the data centers as well. Our whole network will gradually shift to OpenStack. So we need to find a way to get the data centers and the rest of the network to interoperate seamlessly. I need the same OS for my network and for the data center. And I need a totally seamless integration. So, for instance, that's why we contributed back to the OpenStack community things like BGP capabilities within the Neutron. So that we would see only one bloody network and we wouldn't have to consider that there is a data center on one hand and the, and the one on the other hand. All of that made us also touch by working with the code contributing back things, etc. identify, we identify few areas where we do believe there is a possible dif uh, differentiation of the operator without mingling with the code. So keep the vanilla open source solution, but somehow put a little bit of differentiation on top. If we were then to foresee a little bit where a, a large operator would go, and I think this is a pretty high level, so Many, many of you in the room uh, will, will potentially find it useless, but it helps federating the views within a company like Orange, and it also helps Orange and other telcos to cooperate on a shared path towards the cloud. First, there will be a basic infrastructure. Most people do spend a lot of time do uh, uh, most of their transformation time on it. We do believe that it will happen. We do believe that we do not have to put too much effort on that, meaning OpenStack as a community is delivering. We are contributing back some improvements. It will work. We put here Access Network because eventually in time, it also will run on OpenStack. Why? Because we're going to decentralize a lot of caching and storage very, very close to the customers. But all of that will be managed as one single aggregated network. So you will have potentially in a country like France, 500 POPs with OpenStack capabilities. And those 500 POPs will be managed as one very large and virtual data center. Because you will need to collocate data at the closest possible point to your customer. We will use PaaS on top of this infrastructure because it helps us getting the same agility as the ones OTTs will claim. And whatever we do will bring data back to our analytics capabilities in order to get a quasi real-time understanding of what customers like, don't like, what they use, what they don't use, and, by the way, also using that big data to detect what is going right or wrong in the network. 
Orchestration for us is key. It's, it's very often uh, not of a concern for SMEs or for startups, but for us it is fundamental. We are not providing all the bricks and elements to build a service, but we do orchestrate bricks and elements to deliver an end-to-end -end service. Service chaining is at the very beginning. Now, we do believe that a proper service chaining policy, a proper resource allocation policy, will make a difference from one operator to the other. Hence, we are working with many partners to try and understand how they can come with solutions, bringing really any type of orchestration, but not only, extending this type of orchestration to any potential asset that would run on the grid. And then you have a, an IS, because you still need to build the customers. If not, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't have the pleasure to stand here. On the one hand, some services will adopt the DevOps model. Why? Because we can easily decouple them from the rest of the pack. We can put APIs between them and the legacy world. So if you can, then the advice is to adopt such an approach. Not everything will go. There will be network functions which will probably not go in a DevOps model. Why? Because we go really on service chaining a long chain of uh, basic elements. Those elements are standardized. They obey to interfaces which are standardized, blah, blah, blah. So we don't see any value in a DevOps mode there. And then there will be plenty of service platforms which either will be legacy and not adapted to a DevOps model or intrinsically will get no advantage of a DevOps model because they will not need to change on a weekly basis. And all of that need to work through APIs so that you do not allow for integration to be the model anymore, but simply and only loose coupling and API consumption. It looks like completely simplistic, stupid. But again, if it is from a technology perspective easy to do, it is a fundamental change in the culture of the company. Now, what would take maybe five minutes to adopt in a startup on the West Coast will take years and years and years to implement in a large organization like Orange. And I do believe that other telcos face exactly the same challenge. Now, we do believe in open source as a true source of innovation and a true catalyst of innovation within Orange. We do have numerous uh, R&D teams working on uh, open source projects, contributing back to open source communities and leveraging massively on open source components when we do deliver some services. Probably when you look at that, especially the greenish part, but probably as well the service platform, even though they are not in a DevOps mode, will 99.9% .9 rely on open source components. And that's a, a deep shift as well. I rarely saw a so drastic and so fast move out of traditional legacy commercial solution. It is really a shift which is embarking hundreds and hundreds of engineers learning what is available, open source on the market and leveraging properly on it. Databases, meaning we are for instance contributing to Cassandra, we're also working to, with MongoDB, uh, Jenkins, Android, meaning the OS question uh, is really uh, central to us. We do contribute to many of those uh, open source projects. And one of the, one of the decisions which we took, thanks again to the, uh, the, the, the R&D teams who were really pioneering in that respect, is that we decided massively to adopt OpenStack as a cloud technology for whatever will be OpenStack ready. Again, I repeat, a lot of the legacy codes are actually not at all fit for a cloud. And those stuff will probably not put on OpenStack because it would bring more problems than solutions. But whatever code we're going to source as of now can be audited 
and will be meted against what we call the cloudification or the cloud readiness and so that we know whether we are buying a legacy code or a cloud ready code. Since we are sourcing most of the code we do operate, it is now showing that the industry is at a very variable re level of readiness versus that transformation. And actually it is changing the landscape because we see our classical providers struggling through this transformation the same way as we do, transforming their business many times from appliance providers to software editor, but still not rewriting completely the code. And they face small companies who did it right from day one because they were just in the right DNA for that and rewrote their code from day one and come with a code which is cloud ready 100% leveraging on open source solutions, horizontally scalable to meet whatever volumes we would want. Things like that do impact Orange, but they also do impact all our ecosystem. And we see a complete opening of the uh, set of, of partners. We have uh, been obviously focusing a little bit more on the network side and on other things. So we have, for instance, contributed back to OpenStack several improvements on the Neutron module. We're also part of Open Delight. We have uh, been working at integrating uh, Open Control on OpenStack. So one of the key challenges for us is really to get OpenStack as a global, a global OS across data centers and networks and making sure that we can operate that seamlessly. We do believe that not the whole uh, path has been gone through. For instance, uh, on the storage side, uh, we think Ceph is a project that could really bring uh, OpenStack storage to a next level. I mean, the truth being that at this moment in time, in my OpenStack implementation, there is still a filer used to provide block storage, which is heretic. I mean, it, it shouldn't happen. Well, it still happens. Now, if I had the right distributed block storage capability, I wouldn't have to go there. Thing like that. We need to make sure that it is carrier grade. Carrier grade doesn't mean that we want a specific flavor of OpenStack. It means that we need to contribute back few few uh, improvements so that we can deploy it in operation. And this is not a far-fetched kind of forecast. I mean, before the end of the year, we're going to have some workloads in production, real workloads with, with real customers, et cetera, et cetera, not just uh, test stuff on the R&D side. We need to get uh, an open NFV uh, orchestration, an open NFV project, which will really help federating many, many players in the ecosystem to find out what the right model will be. Knowing that the model of engagement between the suppliers and the telco providers will change deeply. And we need to find ways to get the path, Cloud Foundry, OpenShift, whatsoever, to gracefully interoperate with the NFV orchestration. Several companies are working on that. We didn't see yet, for instance, the, the breakthrough in a proper integration and a proper over between a pass and uh, an NRV orchestrator. Just project yourself in this new world. A vendor would come to Orange, would put their source code on the pass, and the source code would be then uh, push, pushed into the uh, continuous deployment uh, chain and would end up in a data center as a, a, an operational workload. This is a completely different model than I come to tell you that I'm going implant to in implement in your data center an appliance. I've been spending far too much of the time. I don't know if we have still a bit of time for some questions. If you have questions, there are mics in the LAs, so feel free. Uh, I'm pretty interested. You need to go to the mic. The mic will not go to you. Sorry for that. Hello, Yu Zhongsheng, Huawei Technology. I have a question from 
based on your version, I'm very interested in how will be the R&D uh, R and D sites in the future of Orange. Will be more than today or can you hurt? There is sabotage. No. No sound anymore. Ah. The, so, uh, the control room. Ah yeah. Here you go. Yeah, it's better now? Yeah. Ah okay. Uh you don't show Huawei technology. I have a question regarding the uh, based on your version uh, regarding uh, how is your uh, vision the R&D uh, R&D sites of Orange will be will be more or will be less? What do you mean by R&D sites? Yeah, your R&D team sites. No? Yeah. So it's if you do the open source, come back and do the contribution, and you do more than today, what's your R&D doing or the R&D sites is a very well, interesting. As a general trend, operators do not grow at this moment in time, right? Yeah. Uh, especially when they are faced to a, a competitive European market. We are not in the US, so mm -hmm. uh, we do decrease. Now, having said that, there are such gains in productivity that we could still benefit from a larger uh, production in the years to come with fewer people if we are successful at upscaling them. And the key question for us as an R&D team is not so much the number of people, but the number of people who are cloud ready. As I took the example, if I have a technical architect today who is used to describe the whole architecture in a Word document, tomorrow you will have to script this same uh, architecture and push it to Horizon and push it to uh, the, the, the infrastructure. So that is a complete shift. Now, we do see the opportunity here to redefine how we do R&D with our partners because most probably there is an opportunity to rebase completely the engagement model with our partners. If you take, I, I always take the same example, you take prepaid IM, very, very critical piece of hardware. Today you deliver the whole thing. Tomorrow, I will probably ask you to put your source code at the beginning of my pipe, somewhere in a pass. I will guarantee that the source code is protected, I don't look at it, blah, 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 but it will then compile and deliver in the continuous integration chain. Your application will use my compute, my storage, my databases, will be orchestrated by my orchestrator, so it's really only the application that is left. And this application is under your control. How do we engage? From an R&D perspective, so that you can commit on the performance of your solution, and we can take ownership on the end-to-end -end service. It's a very different world. But the numbers of the people is not my concern. The readiness and the skill, the upskilling of the people is really what counts. I got a question that you have mentioned uh, why you choose open source to develop uh, services uh, and you need to manage the code is that you can have full access of the code and uh, thi this will help you uh, for take care of user privacy, uh, uh, privacy for security reasons. Uh, what I want to know is on the other hand uh, other guys also have fully access with open source codes and they are easily to find the weakness in the code. So it's harm harmful to security issues. Well, first, uh, it's not because you share an open source code that you will get less secure. What I mean here is that the, the dream that because the code is hidden, nobody will be able to reverse engineer your code and, and nobody will be able to uh, find out the, the weaknesses, I think has long gone. We have demonstration every day that a code can be reverse engineered. Obf obfuscation, things like that, fail most often. The true, the true uh, way we believe to manage security is to understand where there are weaknesses, and there will always be, and to manage around those weaknesses. 
So that's why, for instance, we had a work on the security urbanism on OpenStack, because we do believe that there is no way we're going to get perfect codes. So we need to be able to have very dynamic measurement, very dynamic countermeasures implemented when we do detect strange behaviors around a piece of workload. Hi, um, I work for a company that develops uh, optimization NFEs, and uh, one thing you mentioned a couple of times there was NFE orchestration. Uh, I think we've struggled to identify really a leader in that area or clear APIs. Do, do you think there's a, a gap here or, or somebody needs to fill that, that gap or define APIs so vendors can develop against that and, and people like Orange can deploy it without having any vendor lock-in? Well, we saw few companies having something which starts to be reasonably uh, demonstrative, right? Uh, the risk for us and for the industry is that, as you say, we would fall into a proprietary implementation, hence the Open NAV Forum, where we do try and have a completely neutral definition of which APIs and capabilities we should have in such an orchestrator, so that not only the orchestrator editors could come with solutions which we would test against that scheme, and also any software editor would then be able to certify that their workload would work against those orchestrators. And it is critically important that the concept of interoperability, which is, I think, in the DNA of operations in, in the telco side, would translate in that new world. Open NAV for us is the right vehicle. Thank you. Um, Tal from Amdocs. I have a question. Um, I saw your presentation. You mentioned about career-grade OpenStack. To which level do you look at career-grade OpenStack? And another one is what you said before about commercialization of NFV orchestration. We see a lot of companies doing that. They are trying to do that. Will Orange ever consider to go to a commercial version of NFV? Because whatever we see here is apparently not, not that good. <laughs> So, carrier grade. Again, the purpose is not to have a telco version of the OpenStack, but to enrich OpenStack to cover as well the telco needs. For instance, we saw SPOF in Neutron, and that is not acceptable for a telco. So, we need to make sure that OpenStack keeps evolving and enriching to cover our needs. Second, well, it's a bit early for NAV orchestrators because every guy who so far developed an NAV orchestrator, developed it because he wanted to sell the workload below. Right? So there is very often a tight uh, lock-in between the workload and the orchestration, which is exactly what we don't want. And as I said, we need to get still a standard de facto, uh, not standardization in the... <laughs> but a de facto standard to emerge with regard to APIs and capabilities that we expect from an NAV orchestrator which also means that probably we need to get from the Open NAV initiative the ability to certify that uh, such an orchestrator complies with what uh, Open NAV will promote as a future standard. And yes, we aim at going for commercial releases because we don't believe that our added value is to reinvent the wheel. But what we will be attentive to is whether we can or not have some few elements of differentiation in that orchestration, but very, very thin. Time? Thank you all. <laughs>